Good morning, church. I want to study with you this morning from, uh, in John chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and uh, turn your Bibles there, John chapter 2. And we're going to be talking about uh, wedding in Scripture and marriage in Scripture. Uh, weddings are always an exciting and fun time for people, busy time, stressful time for people. Uh, I can remember about 13 or 14 years ago, I was uh, kind of fresh into ministry uh, starting in my first work, and I remember uh, meeting, finding out I was going to be meeting with my my first couple, or at least half of it, uh, for premarital counseling. And I had finally settled in my office, got it painted just the color I wanted, and I had probably ten books on my bookshelf, four of which were the Bible, uh, and was just kind of hitting the ground running. And I remember uh, when they came in and they were looking for advice, I thought the first thing that struck me that was interesting was that their parents had accompanied them there. And so I was sitting at the desk and they were sitting directly across from me and then the parents were kind of in the background. And I thought maybe they were there just to be the color commentary because as we were having a discussion, I was watching the reactions on their face and it was kind of like, it was pretty interesting. Let me put it that way, Okay. <laughs> And uh, as, as they were talking to me, you know, they would say things, they, mostly it was antagonizing over this person that they were planning to marry. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And they were just saying, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not very often very happy. And they said, and this frustrates me about them and that. And I can see the parents doing this in the background. Yep, yep, yep. And I'm like, oh boy. And so on and so on. And the conversation just went and I, and I listened and I tried to do the best I could to, to be a, a good advisor and, and really show that I was listening intently. And as the conversation went on, I, I just said, well, what, if, if things are this bad, I said, what is it that's inclining you to go through with this? What's, what's leading? And they, and they said to me, I just don't know if God will ever send me someone else to marry. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and mom and dad are in the background still just, now they're, now they're doing this. They went from this to just doing this. And here was, here was my grain of 22-ish year old wisdom. I mean, from all the years of my in-depth experience about marriage, having been married six months myself, I said, here's my advice. Don't just settle. Don't just settle. You know, when I, I think about marriages, when I think about weddings, I've, I've done many. I'm still waiting for the day. I've done all kinds of weddings, love weddings, all sorts um, I, I'm still waiting for the day somebody lets me do that princess bride routine for their wedding. Uh, you know, marriage, the blessed event which brings us together today. <laughs> but, but I haven't found them yet. So if any of you are looking to get married and you're interested in that, call me. I'm, I'll do it for free. All right. I'll, be, I'll gladly volunteer to do that wedding. Uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of traditional things that we associate with weddings. Uh, typically, we, we think of various parts of weddings that we just assume to be a part of the process. Um, a lot of people like to do scripture reading at weddings. I encourage that. I think that's fantastic. Uh, most of us can guess what verse is going to be read. What, what do we think would be read at a wedding? Come on, you know it. First Corinthians. Have you not been to weddings or is that a, <laughs> is that a Northern thing? Maybe I thought that was okay. Well, most people like to read scripture at weddings, but I'm, I'm trying to get people to buy into reading a hymn at the wedding instead of scripture. And I think Jesus is coming soon is a real appropriate one, you know, <laughs> to just do a real dramatic reading at the beginning of the wedding. Troublesome times are here, <laughs> filling men's hearts with fear and freedom we all hold dear now is at stake. You know? So if you're interested in that, call me and I'll be glad to do your wedding for you. Well, here we are in John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana. And the book of John, there's a lot of important things we need to recognize about the book of John. There are seven signs that John talks about in his gospel. And he says, these things are written so that you might believe. Each one of these signs, each one of these miracles that Jesus performs, informs our understanding of who God is. And it informs our understanding of what God is capable of. And so we want to pay close attention as we look at these signs, these seven signs that John gives to recognize who God is through that sign and, and to understand what we should learn about God. And so this first sign is performed at a wedding. And we need to understand in Scripture that weddings play a significant role not only between the couple that is being married, but 
Weddings and marriage play a key role in the Old Testament and God's people understanding their relationship with God. Time and time again in the Old Testament, God refers to his people and his relationship with them as a a relationship between a husband and a wife. And there are a lot of things when you think about it that we uh, associate with marriage that we find in our relationship with God. At the very core of marriage is the idea of covenant. At the very core of marriage is the idea of love. And beyond that, we think about ideas that are associated with weddings like purity, holiness, and the presence of God in these witnesses. We think about it having to do with holiness and all of these other aspects that also describe our relationship with God. And what's interesting also is that when we finish the New Testament and get to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, we read about Uh, the vision given to John and the way it's expressed to him is in the form of a wedding feast, the feast of the lamb. And how uh, he says in John 19 and verse seven, he says, blessed are those who are invited to the feast. And so weddings play a really key role. And I think that's part of the reason why John picks this particular atmosphere or environment for this first miracle is because all of those things are built into our understanding of marriage, And so a wedding feast is something significant. It's representative of a lot of important biblical principles. And so as we begin in John chapter 2, we find ourselves going to this wedding, attending it with Jesus and his mother, as well as six of his other disciples, the six who are called in the previous verses in the book of John. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding and his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now there's a couple of important things I want to point out to you as we begin in this text this morning. Number one, Jesus' mother in the book of John is only mentioned two times. You'll find her here in John chapter 2 and you won't find her again until John chapter 19 when she is there at the cross. The second thing that is only mentioned twice in the book of John or really comes up is this situation with the wine at the wedding. And then the wine uh, is found in John chapter 19 with Jesus on the cross. Jesus says he is thirsty in order to fulfill prophecy, John says. And so they offered him wine. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. But that's important for us to recognize these two features only appear in two places in John. So as John is writing his book, he anticipates that we'll be able to understand these two things. When we see Jesus's mother, it reminds us of the wedding feast at Cana. And when we see the wine again at the end in chapter 19, it should take us back to this place as well. And so here we are at the wedding and the wine has run out. Well, we, we talked about our traditions for weddings. A Jewish wedding would last a day in terms of the actual ceremony and religious rites and those kind of components of the wedding. But the feast or the party afterwards would last a week Thank you, Lord, that we have moved on from that. Who's got daughters? Amen. I mean, thank you. We don't have to feed the people for a whole week, okay? We're in luck. It's a good thing. It's a blessing. Thank you. We're no more Old Testament, Lord. We're in the New Testament now. (laughs) Ten-minute ceremony and cupcakes, and we're out of here, okay? Uh, But when when you think about that, okay, this is important. Now, think about the elements that we hold in high regard that are associated with weddings, and imagine if somebody skips it. Imagine if the preacher was doing a wedding and you were there and when he gets to the end, he just closes his notes and say, says that's the end. And he never gets to the part of you may now do what? Go eat. That's right. And so <laughs> you can now kiss the bride, right? Imagine if he skipped that. We'd all be like, well, now, wait a minute. And I could just imagine the groom saying, now I paid you. You will say that part so I can kiss her, right? I mean, we can imagine that there would be a disturbance in what was going on. And it's the same is true here with Jesus and his mother. As they go to this wedding, all this time and this investment and this preparation has been put into this wedding. And what we find is there's a lacking that's there. The wine runs out beforehand. And this tradition was held in such high regard according to ancient tradition that the uh, host of the wedding could actually be sued for running out of wine at the wedding. Okay, so this is something that's pretty highly regarded as a part of what's going on. And so the wine runs out and now all of a sudden everyone who is at this celebration finds themselves in a bad way. 
And yet I think as John is giving this to us, he's trying to give us a deeper teaching that's behind this. He's not just trying to say that there was no wine at the wedding. He's not just trying to say that Jesus could take this water and turn it into wine. Okay, but there are some teachings and some principles I think he wants us to take away from this. One of them mainly, as we'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute, is the idea of insufficiency. Okay, insufficiency. The supply was insufficient for the demand. People became disappointed in what was provided. It takes me to this idea that the world will let us down. Okay? Even in all of its effort, even all of the host's effort, and there was well-intentioned, I'm sure, to make sure there was plenty of provision, it came up wanting. The world will let us down. Okay? People will let us down. We'll find ourselves in circumstances and, and situations where we have high expectations and we find things wanting. And maybe one of the biggest illustrations I think that John is trying to draw out of this as we move through the remainder of the text is that the old ways were wanting and lacking and insufficient. In particular, the law was insufficient. Even the law would let the people down. You think about the purpose that the wine served at the feast. The wine served the purpose of being a blessing to all of those who were in attendance. To lack wine was to be a disgrace. To lack wine was to be in a position where you were found as a host to be wanting. And all the preparation in the world was not able to provide sufficient for what was needed. And what I wanted to kind of lead our minds to before we get to the rest of the text on, on this point is that a lot of people spend their lives trying to prepare and trying to stockpile the wine. A lot of people spend their lives trying to stockpile things to be, to be ready for whatever the demand is, to have adequate preparation so when the day comes, when it's time to satisfy the need that is there, they won't be found wanting. But here's what I want us to recognize, church, in this passage. No matter the preparation, the people were still found wanting until they went to Jesus. And when they went to Jesus, they were no longer wanting. The wine ran out. All their efforts. Think about the efforts that we put into things in order to be prepared. What is the wine that we invest ourselves into in our lives to try to be prepared to, to fulfill what is necessary and I think about these people in Jesus' day and the things that they would pour themselves into. They tried to stockpile wine through their good deeds we read about in the New Testament, through their own righteousness. They tried to stockpile wine through their religion. They tried to stockpile wine through their church, through their family, through their job. They were trying to find a way to satisfy the need. But the bottom line is, apart from Jesus, no matter the effort that they made to satisfy the, the demand, they would be found wanting. And for us, the same is true, church. Whatever we invest and pour ourselves into to try and be sufficient on our own is going to be found wanting. But only when we go to Jesus Christ do we go to the source that can provide even in the midst of nothing. Even in the midst of nothing. So we see there is a problem. There's a lack of wine. The second problem, and we'll get and uh, kind of find this out here in just a minute. Number one, the wine will run out. Apart from Jesus, the wine will run out. And number two, the wine that you're settling for is less than desirable. It's a sour wine. It's less than desirable. Those are the two problems apart from Jesus when it comes to wine. Let's keep going and you'll see this, this component I think will make more sense to you as we move through. Verse 4, and Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now I want to point out one thing here in verse 4, okay? Because this sounds a little funny to us. I don't recommend that any of you go to your mother or even your wife and say, woman, okay? If you want to go be with Jesus, try that, okay? And that will expedite the process, all right? Woman. All right, that's not the way that Jesus is talking. Let's remember that in John chapter 19, that same passage we were talking about earlier, when Jesus speaks to his mother when he's hanging on the cross and is trying to encourage her and tell her he will provide someone for her, he says to her what? Woman, behold your son. Okay? So this is not the same way that we use this word. This is an, an endearing term, but specific also. And what Jesus is trying to do 
is recognize the relationship, I think, that he's no longer under his mother's authority, and yet he still loves her, he still respects her, okay? So it's not the same way that we would use that terminology. But Jesus says, my time hasn't come yet, okay? His mother, verse 5, said to the servants, do what? Do whatever he tells you. If this was all I had to my sermon today, to leave you with that, I think I would have done well. When it comes to Jesus, do whatever he tells you. Amen, church? You see, and that's the instructions that his mother gives. Whatever it is that Jesus says, I don't necessarily know the way he's going to solve the problem. I don't know how he's going to fix it. But all I can tell you is the best advice in the world is just do whatever he tells you. And by doing what Jesus instructs, they find this need and this lacking to be satisfied. Even though the solution doesn't sound very logical, because you might expect that Jesus' solution would be, here's a hundred bucks, go get some more wine. Okay? Or Jesus might say, there's another wedding going on next door, maybe they've got a surplus that we can look into. Okay? Or maybe people should just drink water and be done with it. Okay? There might be a multitude of solutions that Jesus would offer. Nobody really knows what the answer is going to be, but the simple instruction is do whatever he tells you to do. How often times, church, does scripture give us instruction? Does Jesus tell us something to do? And yet we have hesitation. We don't listen at times because we're struggling. We want to know what does that look like? We want to know, does that fit into the way that I'm living my life? Does that fit into the plan I already have? Is this, is this going to be comfortable? Is this going to be enjoyable? We are asking all these questions when the simple instruction should be, do whatever he tells you. And when we're willing to do that, we will find the all-sufficiency of God. We will find the kind of abundant provision that God talks about in Scripture. The overflow, the leftovers when he provides the food to the multitude, the abounding grace, the peace that passes all understanding. When we are willing to do whatever it is that Jesus tells us to do, we will find that genuineness in our relationship with God. And so they're willing to listen. In verse 6, now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each one holding 20 or 30 gallons. These big jars would be located at the entrance of the feast, at the entrance of the celebration, and you would dip into them and you would pour them over your hands in order to become clean to participate in the meal. Uh, And so Jesus instructs them to take those six jars. Verse 7, he said to the servants, fill them each with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. Now think about what Jesus is saying. He said, now just fill those jars up with water and dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies, if you will. Now, it all sounds fine and good, but that doesn't solve the problem that there's still no wine, okay? And yet the servants listen and they take it to the master of ceremonies. I love that part of this section at the end of verse 8. Jesus tells them what to do, remembering what Mary had said, do whatever he tells you. So they did it. How often in our lives, if someone was writing a narrative about the way that we live and about our faith, would they say, and God told him to do this and he did it? And God told her to do this, and she did it. it wouldn't, and, and it doesn't read, well, first God had to prove himself, and they put out a hundred golden fleeces, and they made sure everything fit in their plans, or they waited till they were ready. Or No, it just says God told them to do this, and so they did it. Or would our testimony look much more blurry about our faith or about our life, that we knew we understood what God wanted us to do, but we hesitated, or we questioned, or we resisted the will of God. Do what he says. And so they do. Verse 9, it gives us the last part of this story. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now having become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples did what church believed in him. After this, he went to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And they stayed there for a few days. 
Going back to verse 9, he tasted, he did not know where it came from, but he tasted its goodness. And then he goes on to the groom and says, everyone else saves the worst for last, but you have saved what is best. I think there are several important principles here, but the main thrust of this sign that Jesus performs, I think we find, is in the ability to transform that which is undesirable, that which is common, that which is discardable, and to make it into something that is precious and valuable and desirable by all and recognized as good. This is the power of Jesus Christ that we will learn more about as we move through the Gospel of John, that he is capable of not only taking water and turning it into wine, but he's capable of taking sinners and turning them into saints. He is capable of taking the dirtiness of our sin and the distance that we have gone from God and he is able to restore us, to reconcile us. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, he is able to reconcile us to God because he became sin for us. When we're talking about God being capable to take that which is common and undesirable and transform it. I'm not talking about water, church. I'm talking about us. None of us were noble. None of us were wise. None of us were affluent. And so God chose us, but he chose the foolish things of this world to demonstrate his power in the weak things of this world. God has the power to transform things, to change them from unvaluable to valuable He brought fullness where there was emptiness. There was no more wine. It was just empty. And he filled those jars and he brought fullness where there was emptiness. And in the same way in my life, God brings fullness where it was empty, where it was void. God brought about joy where there was disappointment. Going throughout the feast, you can imagine the mumblings of the people and their dissatisfaction. My cup's empty, right? How many of you have ever been in a place? I mean, it doesn't take long before you get frustrated. You're at a restaurant and that water's dry and you're like... Right, and you got to have a drink, and you and the waiter keeps walking by, and trying, and you get. I mean, the second time they walk by, you're ready to just give me some gloves because I'm going to box them. Right? I mean, I'm just angry. It's how it is. Right? And you can imagine that frustration and that disappointment. And yet, when Jesus is able to get his hand into the situation, he turns that disappointment and dissatisfaction into joy for the people and into blessing. He's able to transform things. He took something that was external only, this water that was able to wash hands. External only, and he transforms it into wine, that which can satisfy and bless even the internal parts of these people. Heaven and earth themselves intersect in what Jesus does through this transformation. And transformation has been done before, by the way. The first time we read about water being transformed into something is not in the New Testament. Surprisingly enough, it's in another place I sometimes like to go called the Old Testament. And we find it with Moses. Moses takes water and he transforms it into what? Blood. Now water into blood is more symbolic of judgment. And maybe death. Water into blood. But Jesus takes water and he turns it into wine. He takes something that is common and makes it extraordinary. He takes something that is bad and that it is unclean. They're washing their hands with it and he turns it into something good. And when Jesus turns water into wine, that is a transformation of grace. Are you with me, church? Jesus is able to transform. And Jesus is able to do amazing things. It tells us the purpose of this sign in verse 11. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his what, church? His glory. Oh, come on, church. Are you with me? He manifested his what? His glory. All right. Now, let me just wake up. I fell asleep myself there for a minute. All right. Manifested his glory. Now, Jesus was able to manifest his glory in something that was physical. In this water, he turned it into wine. And it says, now, Jesus' glory was manifested to them through that process. Now, here's my question to us this morning, church. We say, well, if Jesus was to come in here this morning and turn water into wine, man, my faith would be stronger. Then I'd be like the disciples and I'd say I believe in him. And actually, the greater miracle would be to turn the rain into sunshine today. I'd take that, right? Then we'd believe, right? But, but when we think about it, it's something physical, okay? But God is doing something greater today than turning water into wine. The transformation that he does in our lives, if we're willing to be transformed, if we're willing to do what scripture says, 
put away the idea of conforming to the world and living the way they live for acceptance from them and instead choose to be transformed by God and let him be glorified in us. If water to wine can manifest the glory of God, how much more so if I choose to live my life for him, can he manifest his glory in me to this world? Do we pray about that? Do we pray to God to help us in our transformation? Do we pray to God to take us and take all the things that he needs to change in our life and change them, even if it's hard, even if it means sacrifice, if it means struggle, I'm willing to do it because I want God's glory to be manifest in me. God is able to transform. God desires to manifest his glory in this world. And the question is, are we willing as his people to let his presence shine forth from us? Let me emphasize this last point and we'll finish. He says, you saved the best for last, and that is not normally what people do. Here's a question I want you to ask yourself this morning, church. Have you already been the best that you can be? Have you already been the best that you can be? Have you lived your best life for God already? Have you given your most or your best at the beginning and now there's nothing left? Nothing but sour wine. Nothing to look forward to but more wrinkles and more reruns in your future, okay? Have you already been the best of what you can be? People say, the more I get to know you, the more I don't like you. That must be a a northern thing too, right? They're just, you're a Patriots fan, now I don't like you, right? I mean, that's just how it goes. But with God, church, it's the opposite, isn't it? With God, it's the opposite. The more I learn about God, The farther I go in my relationship with God, the deeper I walk in faith, I find myself finding only greater things. The farther and the deeper I go with God, the more I find out I've only touched the surface of his goodness. The best is yet to come if you are a child of God, amen? The best is yet to come. God has greater things in store for us than even the great things that he has done for us already. As we deepen our fellowship with God, we may at every stage say, thou has kept the good wine until now. Amen? Amen. The question becomes, are you ready for the wedding feast of the Lamb? Are you ready for the wedding feast of the Lamb? First principle is don't settle for sour wine that will just leave you thirsty. Don't settle for less. Don't settle at all. But only be satisfied in what you find in Jesus Christ. Secondly, the principle that we learned this morning is do what Jesus says. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus says this. Whoever believes and is baptized will be what, church? Saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Do what Jesus says was Mary's instructions. Do what Jesus says is what scripture beckons for us to do without hesitation and willingly to submit ourselves to the will of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And finally, be transformed by him. Trade our filthy rags for his flowing white robes of righteousness. Trade our sinfulness for his righteousness. Trade the old self for the new self. Be transformed and made new in the likeness of the son of God. And you will find that the best is yet to come. If there's anything we can do for you, I ask that you come forward as we stand and sing.